Shalom. With the death of Shlomo Amelech Solomon, the United Kingdom that had been forged so strongly by David and Shlomo, unfortunately comes to an end. The son of, of Shlomo Rehoboam is unfortunately not as smart or wise as his father. And there was tension already with the northern tribes of Israel, being that Rehoboam and like David went from the tribe of Yehuda, Judah, the south. So they were already experiencing some tension with, with uh, the, uh, the kings. And they asked uh, Rehoboam to lower the taxes, which had been so heavy in the time of Shlomo, building the temple, building palaces, and rebuilding Jerusalem. And um, Rehoboam consulted his advisors, and um, the elders who had served on Shlomo Amelech said to him, speak gently, and they will be your servants forever. But the younger um, counselors, his friends, advised him to, be, to show the people that he is strong and not to give in. So he answered them, if my father hit you with lashes of one stripe, I will hit you with uh, lashes of nine strips. They, of course, left the meeting in great wrath, and they joined a political uh, leader who had already been plotting against Shlomo and in the court of Egypt, uh, by the name of Yerobam, Sherbom. He returns, Yerobam ben Nevat, and he secedes together with the 10 tribes for the north. Unfortunately, a, um, Yerobam not only created a new kingdom, but also he wanted to se sever all the connections of the people to Jerusalem, And he made a decree to close the road so that nobody could come in from the north to um, Jerusalem. And unfortunately, that way, eventually, he led the path to a great sense of idolatry in the northern kingdom. Um, so now we have, in reality, two nations, two, two, two countries. From now on, the, each of the divided kingdoms has its own history, occasionally an alliance, uh, sometimes hostile to one another, but uh, both kingdoms now are separated. And the fate of each is going to be essentially its own and very different. I want to point out uh, some of the stories, first of all, about the kingdom of Yehuda. And here we are going to come to the fame, one of the famous monuments that we see in the um, in history. <clears throat> and I'm referring here to the Mernepta Stella. This stella was considered to be one of the greatest discoveries, archaeological discoveries in, ancient, in the ancient Near East. It is a monument celebrating the victory of the pharaoh, Merneptah, against some of the, the nations that he had conquered. Among the statements in that statement, it actually says that he, um, Israel is laid to waste. And it's interesting that this sentence, Israel is laid to waste, appears to be, perhaps, some archaeologists have thought, was the pharaoh talking about the defeat of the Israel after the Exodus. Unfortunately, that theory has lost its uh, uh, fame now. And I'm going to follow an archaeologist that says that this stella celebrating the victory of this king over Israel was part of a long battle that the Egyptian king had made in the reign of, Yerob, of, of Rehavan. As it says in the book of um, Kings, chapter 14, uh, it was in King Rehavan's fifth year, that year would be, according to the Jewish chronology, 791 before the common era, that, um, that the king came in to Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the temple and the treasures of the king's palace. He took everything. He took all the golden shields that Solomon had made 
And so here we see a incredible story that um, he took the um, shields, the golden shields, so subsequently melted them down and made them into thick sheets of gold to cover the floor of the throne in, 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 in his king, his place, in his palace. According to the theory that we will follow, this is probably this Ramses II, not the Ramses that appears in the Bible, the, the, the king, the pharaoh of the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, but a much later time in one of the conquests that Egypt had made of in the kingdom of uh, Judah in the, in the five years into the kingdom of Rehoboam. That's one of the stories that we find here. And this is the famous Marnetta Stele. I want to show you, um, incidentally, another um, um, view. If you look at, um, sorry, one moment. Um, there's another view, if you take a look at this view, um, you see another picture. And here at the bottom, you see that the, the name where Israel appears is a little bit um, dark. Apparently, that is the, uh, the effect of tourists uh, touching the, um, the stele. You can see it over here. Let's go now into the Kingdom of Israel, what was happening there. The Kingdom of Israel has a fascinating um, new king, probably the strongest of the kings of Israel, King Omri. And we will see that Omri appears also in the annals of some uh, Assyrian documents. He was a very important king, a very evil king, uh, and uh, he created a great resistance. He was very strong militarily, as was his son, who was also a very evil king by the name of Ahab. And as says the Bible, Ahab, the son of Omri, did what was evil in the eyes of God, more than all who preceded him. Now, the story of Ahab is very interesting for many reasons. Uh, first of all, because it appears prominently in the history of the, of the life of king of the prophet Eliyahu. Eliyahu Navi was his main rival, as we will see in two stories that I will tell now. First story is that um, Ahab marries a Phoenician um, queen, a Phoenician uh, princess, by the name of Jezebel or Isabel, who brings to Israel, to the kingdom of Israel, the cult of Baal. Now, the cult of Baal was very orgiastic, with a lot of drinks, and a lot of orgies, a lot of excitement. But I want to point out that the issue of, of, um, of Israel being monotheistic was that many people felt that religion needed a little pizzazz. They needed a little, you know, more excitement. And so many people, they were not rejecting Hashem, they were simply trying to bring some of the cult, some of the ideas, some of the dances, Baal, into the religion of our fathers. And that is the point that, Yehuda, that, that Eliyahu says to the people, one of the famous sentences of Eliyahu, until when are you going to be dancing on two thresholds? If you believe in Hashem, you have to follow Hashem. If you believe in Baal, you follow Baal. But don't go from one to, don't create a syncretistic kind of religion. And that ultimately comes to an end, to a, to a great confrontation, when Eliyahu invites the people of Baal to a great meeting in Mount Carmel, near Haifa, where there he proposes a challenge. The Baal priests, or 400 of them, were going to, serve, to offer a offering to their God, and Eliyahu was going to offer, creating an altar with an offering to Hashem. The point was that nobody was going to have fire. So the fire, whoever from heaven sent the fire, that was the true God. And the story goes that the priests of Baal started to dance around the altar, they cut their flesh, and they started to scream, and Eliyahu 
taunts them and says, shout a little louder to your God. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's on vacation. He doesn't have a break. And all this story, as it was told in the book of Kings, the first book of Kings, chapter 18. Finally, when they give up, Eliyahu asks Hashem, please Hashem, do Lord of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant. Hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord of God, and that you've, tur that, that you've turned their hearts back again. And with that, a fire came down from heaven, and the, uh, the gathered multitude around them immediately said, the famous sentence of Isaiah and Yom Kippur, Hashem wa Elohim, Hashem wa Elohim, the Lord is with their God, Hashem is God. And so the priests of Baal are put to death, and this creates at least a temporary hold to the uh, idolatry in Israel. Um, another story of Ahab, which is very important, very, that Ahab a, um, coveted a, um, and one of the reasons that Ahab was so angry with Eliyahu, he wanted to kill him, was that Ahab wanted, desired a vineyard, famous vineyard of his neighbor, Nagot. He asked him to please give him a, 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 that vineyard and uh, he would pay him money for it. He wanted that vineyard. And Nagot rejected. He said, I'm sorry, this is my ancestry. My parents gave it to me and I don't want to to depart from our family. And so Ahab was very upset. And Jezebel, Isabel, saw that he was upset and said, why are you upset? And he said, well, because Nabot doesn't want to sell me the, the, the vineyard that I like so much. She said, you're a fool. You're the king of Israel. Leave it to me and I'll take care of it. And she arranged for the man to be killed, to be stoned. And then she went over to, um, to the king and said, now you don't need to worry about buying anything. Nabot is no longer alive. But that Eliyahu hears about the story and comes to, to uh, the king, to Ahab, and says to him, and the famous sentence, Eliyahu, the, the prophet, comes and says, Aratzachta begam yarashta. You a, killed, and now you want to inherit also? And so he says, you know, the day will be that you will die and the, you and Isabel will die and the dogs will go around licking your blood. So in effect, this is actually what happens. Ahab eventually dies in battle. Isabel survives for a little while until finally one of the, uh, the kings hurls her from a window onto the street and her body is left to the dogs. As, as prophesied by the proper, by prophet Eliyahu. One of the famous stories of the kingdom. Now, what was happening in Yehuda was a little bit better, although it was not entirely better. The prophets of Israel, we will discuss this at the end of this, this lecture, were actually also talking a great deal, trying to tell the people to improve their ways. And the ways, unfortunately, were going down. Idolatry had entered into the hearts of the people what we would call today assimilation at that time was a time of great um, running after idolatry. The rabbis actually analyzed and say that one cannot imagine the appeal that idolatry had in the hearts of people, the emotional appeal. Um, and so subsequently through several events, I want to tell you um, some of the one of the interesting stories when a... Um, a the, the king of Israel, the king of Judah, actually joined forces, Yoram and Yehuda, and another same uh, name, Yoram and Israel, two kings in separate places. Um, after the death of Ahab, there was a king of Moab who had, take, who had become a little bit bold, and he had reconquered some of the lands that belonged to, to, the, to the Jews, to Israel. And so they decided to retake some of these um, uh, la the, this land, um, the the king of that time was the king of Mesha. It was it was called the king of Moab was called Mesha, and in that time, 
he actually had a um, um, one bat battle which he had won, and that is this famous story that I'm going to tell you now, the famous Stella of Mesha. So this is not it. Sorry. The Mesha Stella. Um, So the, we've seen the Mesha Stella um, commemorating or celebrating the triumph of King Mesha. Um, the story, unfortunately, is that the kings of, of Israel had started to become very rebellious. And so the king of Judah, the great power at this time was Assyria. And the Assyrians now started to control Judah and Israel. Until finally, the, when the, they decided to um, rebel, both Assyria wants to attack the king of Israel first and then the king of, of Judah. We'll talk first about the, the kingdom of Israel. So in, in the year approximately 555, according to our calculations, King Sargon, one of the great emperors of Assyria, comes in, and as it says in the book of, the second book of Kings, and I read, in the ninth year of the reign of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and exiled the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in the river, on the river Habor, in the cities of Media. So he moves them all the way towards Persia and even beyond. And so it was that the Israelites sinned against Hashem. They worship other gods and follow the customs of the nations. So this is the reason that we are exiled. The fact that we did not follow the ways of Hashem. And that's what the Bible tells us. When Israel does not go in the ways of Hashem, as the Torah warns us repeatedly, we unfortunately encounter this kind of, of tragedy. As the prophets had said, repent from your evil ways and observe my commandments. But they did not listen. They stiffened their necks. Then God became very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. None remained except the trouble of Judah. This is a famous story when Assyria exiles the 10 tribes. Now, as you know, what was the custom of the Assyrians to move population from one place to, other, to another in order to make them lose their pride in their land? And so they moved the Jews out of Samaria and they brought to Samaria another people from another place that they had conquered just to resettle, the resettlement by the Assyrians. Interestingly enough, the people that were brought to Samaria, who are non-Jews, felt that since Samaria and the land of Israel was controlled by a god, not theirs, by a god, the god of Israel, so they had to become part of the god of Israel. And so they converted to Judaism. Conversion was a little bit um, you know, incomplete, to the point in which later generations, the rabbis would question whether these people were Jews or not Jews. And we call them Kuthians, because they probably came from the place called Kuta. And this appears, well, we today even, there are Samaritans in the city of Nablus, you can visit. They have the Torah, they observe Shabbat, they observe many of the laws of Torah, and they consider themselves to be Jews. But the rabbis do not accept them as Jews today, because they do not accept many of the rabbinic laws, and therefore, we are not sure that they what their ancestry is. So that's the story of the ten lost tribes. We hope one day in the future, when the Shia will come, that these tribes, wherever they are scattered, will people will discover that they have a Jewish ancestry and then return to be part of our people. As we discussed already, there are tribes in Africa. We discussed last last week the story of the Lemba tribe may have been one of the 10 lost tribes. Uh, it may be um, that, that uh, people in India um, may, uh, even today, they, they call themselves the name Benashe, that they have found themselves to be part of, of the Jewish people. Um, and there are people that say that the Pashtu 
the people who are connected in Afghanistan, even with the, the Taliban, may be the tribe, also one of the tribes of Israel. In any case, this is not um, sure for us. We hope that Messiah will come and we'll be able to find it. But let's go back to the Assyrians. The Assyrians were angry with Judah as well. But the king in Judah, the most important king that we want to discuss is the king Yechizkiyahu or Hezekiah. Hezekiah was incidentally married to the daughter of the prophet Isaiah. The Bible says about him as follows. He did what was right in the eyes of God and he trusted in the God of Israel. There was none like him among all the kings of Judah who were after him nor before him. So he was one of the greatest kings of Israel. He lived at a time when the Assyrians were attacking and exiled the, ten, the, the other tribes in the, the north. We will discuss in a moment that the Assyrians came to attack him as well. But first, a word about him. He was such a prominent and righteous man that the rabbis say about him that he could have been the Messiah. He could have been Mashiach. He was a profoundly successful, great student of Torah, great uh, leader, and had all the qualities of being a conqueror of, of, of the world. Unfortunately, the Bible says that he refused to, and one of the major victories that he had had, he did not praise Hashem. He did not make a party for Hashem. And the fact that he lacked that, he missed that recognition of what Hashem, of the strength of Hashem, made him lose that opportunity to be that great man. Uh, another story about him is that Hezekiah did, did, had sown a dream that he was going to have a very evil king as a son, or evil son. Uh, and so he refused to marry and refused to have a child. Isaiah berated him and told him that you cannot control the ways of Hashem. You have to marry and you have to have a son. And unfortunately, he did have a son who was a very bad son, Menashe. But that was not his concern. The um, created, incidentally, uh, one of the big constructions in Yerushalayim, that you can see in the, the tunnel of Hezekiah, and also the walls of Hezekiah that archaeologists have found today in all of Jerusalem. And the, uh, he's the one who created the, the famous pool of Shiloh, the, that connects the spring at the bottom of, it, of Yerushalayim to the upper part of the city, so they can have water without having to go out to the city. It's an amazing piece of work, of 533 meters long that you can actually visit today. But um, the great story of Atanjakaya is that eventually uh, Sennacherib came, actually, the king of Assyria came to lay siege, probably, according to our calculations, they have 547 in the era. And um, the, uh, a miracle, he decided, Atanjakaya said that in order to forestall the attack, everybody should go and study Torah. And everybody studied, and uh, on the one night, they go out, they, they, and they discover that everybody in the camp of, of, a, of a Syria had died from a plague, and uh, they, the rest had fled. And that was a great salvation for the, for the people. And uh, he was saved. So Assyria goes, he had attacked Israel, but leaves Judah alone. Um, Meanwhile, in the story of, of uh, Yehuda, we have a famous grandson of Hezekiah by the name of, of great grandson, by the name of Yoshiao, Josiah, who also is a great and wonderful king. Uh, but unfortunately, they, in the, uh, some of the kings that follow you, Josiah, some of his sons and, and grandchildren and, and uncles begin to rebel against the new power. Assyria's power had been now conquered by Babylonia. The Babylonian power now controls Israel. And when the kings of Israel, or in this case Judah, want to rebel against Babylonia, they um, first they take the young king by the name of Yoyachin and they move him to Babel to teach him a lesson, leaving his uncle, Zedekiah, Zekiah, to be the king, but obviously with a lot of control. Yoyachin goes out to Babylonia together with a lot of the nobles of Israel, including the prophet Ezekiel, Mordechai, that we're going to see in this Megillah Pester, and many others, and Daniel, 
and he creates in Babel, in Babylonia, what is going to be the seed of the Babylonian Persian exile that was going to be lasting for centuries. But in Yehuda, there was a little bit of quiet because they realized that Babylonia was very strong and was going to be punishing them. But in the end, finally, um, Zedekiah decides on the advice of that advisor, not Jeremiah, the prophet, counsels him not to do that, to remain neutral. But Zedekiah decides to join forces with Egypt and together with Egypt to rebel against Babylonia. Babylonia comes in and puts a siege to the city, eventually burning the city of Jerusalem and burning the temple. This terrible story of, um, of the end of, of Yehuda, the destruction of the temple um, on the night of Av, according to our calculations, the year 421, um, the, the city is, is laid, is destroyed, and on that day, the prophet Jeremiah composes a lament that now we have it in the book of Lamentations, the book of Eicha, what violence is done to us, what shame besmirches us, for we had to leave our homeland, abandon our dwelling places. Death came in by our windows, broke into our palaces, swept away the child from the alleyway, the youngsters from the squares, and men's bodies lie upon the fields. That is the story that we unfortunately often have to read on uh, each other. The reign of the Davidic house had come to an end and devastated Yehuda, and now it became a Babylonian province. The a lot, large number of Judeans, including many high officers now, went away with the um, exile to Babylonia. And that comes to the end of the story of Yehuda. But the prophet Jeremiah tells them that do not worry, this is going to be only a temporary exile. 70 years later, they will be able to return and rebuild the temple. And that's the story that we're going to tell. I want to tell, take a moment in the next few minutes, now that we cover the part of the history, so just once again, following the chronology that we are following the Jewish chronology, um, that Solomon dies in the year 796, approximately, and the temple, the, the, second, the, the temple of Jerusalem, is destroyed in the year 421, so a period of about 400 to 380 years. In this period of time, we had the kingdom of Israel, which is destroyed about 100 years before the Judah. And then the 10 lost tribes go away, and now the kingdom of Judah is also destroyed. Very little, few people stay in the land, of course, in small little towns, there are always people there, and they will wait for 70 years until they will return partially. Many of the people escaped to Egypt, Others, of course, went to Babylonia, and many others may have gone to, no, to uh, uh, Asia Minor, to Turkey, and from there probably to Greece, and maybe even to Rome. And it is possible that there were people already in Rome and in other, in other islands in the Mediterranean already from this period of time. I want to point out, incidentally, that during this period of time, when the Jews were very strong, the Egypt, Egypt had requested that some Jewish soldiers was known as they are today to be very brave and very intelligent soldiers to man a fortress in the south of Egypt to prevent the invasion by um, the, the Ethiopians. And that fortress is in the city of Elephantine. And we have actually papyri that tell the story of these Jews of Elephantine. You can read about it. And um, they, the, the correspond with the rabbis of Jerusalem uh, about Pesach, about Mitzvot, and so on. Uh, so the story of the Jews of Elephantine is also an interesting story in its own right, and it is possible that many of them may have been left behind 
and they may be what is the origin of what we call today the Ethiopian Jews, the Falashas. Now that we cover this basic part of history, and, and, and we go very fast in this, but I just wanted to cover this period of time with you so you get the feeling of the great names, and let's I'm going to review Rehavam and Yerobama, the first kings of the new kingdom. The major kings are, as we discussed already, in uh, Israel, Achav, Omri, and Achav, and, um, and you know, the, finally, the, the, the Yerobam the second, and Oshea, who are the kings of Israel. In Yehuda, you have other uh, important kings until you get to Hezekiah, um, one of the most important kings of Israel, and his uh, grandson, Yoshiao, Josiah. The last, one of the last kings is Yoyachin, the young king who is taken to Babylonia first to intimidate the Jews. It doesn't work out because Zedekiah, his uncle, anyway, revolts against Babylonia, causing the destruction. During this period of time, in all this period, from the time of Eliyahu until the time of the destruction, we, we have in Israel is prophets. Now the prophets, the idea of prophecy in Israel, just like in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, implies that Hashem is constantly communicating with the Jewish people. And it communicates through the venue, through the vehicle of a prophet. A prophet is a little bit what we would call today a rabbi who, has a, a, who is able to derive wisdom, not only from his analysis of text, but most importantly, from an actual communication with Hashem himself who actually goes and talks to them. So I want to point out the three main prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Yehezkel, Ezekiel. And the reason these are the most important are that they wrote extensively, or rather they spoke extensively and their speeches are collected in these large books. These are called the great prophets. And then there are 12, which are called minor prophets. Each of them has its own characteristic. And they, in Hebrew, we call them treasar, the, the collection of the 12 minor prophets. They're minor because they're small uh, books, not because they're minor in personalities. So I want to quickly talk a little bit about each, some of the prophets. Isaiah, of course, is the prophet that announces the Messiah, the stress and justice, um, the, 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 the love of Jerusalem, the famous concept of, that we will be at the light of the nations, that our house will be the house of prayer for all the nations. These are the famous sentences of Isaiah. Um, among the Treasar, among the 12 tribes, you have the famous Amos from the city of Tekoa, who is very angry with injustice. He, he actually uh, believes that it is, you know, there's unequal distribution of wealth, and he complains about the fact the rich, how they exploit the poor. Um, and, um, you know, he reproaches the priest for being, uh, for not being more moral. Um, and then the, uh, the famous Yonah, Jonah, who goes to, who refuses to um, help the people of Nineveh to return to God, and, and he runs away until the whale um, throws, you know, say, you know, saves him from the sea. And eventually he goes to prophesy in Nineveh, and he, the people return to God. Then there were the prophet Micah, Mike Micha, the famous author of that sentence, what, you, what does God want from you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly before the Lord. These are the famous sentences. Um, then we have the great um, prophet Jeremiah, the prophet that last days of the temple in Judah, in Judea, who is reluctant to undertake his mission because he saw that the destruction was going to come. He's very upset and sad, telling the people everything will be destroyed. People don't want to listen to him. They even put him in prison at some point because he is so negative, but he's telling the truth. And unfortunately, um, he, is, you know, he's, he also prophesies in the end that eventually the Jewish people will return to the land. As they said, to, to say, Hashem says to Rachel, who's crying, don't cry, your children will return to their borders. And then we have the prophet Ezekiel, finally, who is in uh, Babylonia, in per eventually, in, eventually in Persia, and there is a, is a, he was a priest, and he dreamed about the 
two things. Number one, the fact that the Jewish people will return to Israel and they will not stay in the exile. In fact, he criticizes the Jews for wanting to stay in Israel in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the exile. And uh, he prophesies how the temple will be rebuilt. Uh, the, 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 structure, the structure is such that we believe that he was describing what is called the third temple, not the temple that's going to be rebuilt in his time, which is the second temple. The, the details, the way he writes about it, is the way that the third temple will be rebuilt. The Ezekiel is famous, most famous for that vision of the valley of the dry bones. When he sees dry bones, you know, and God says, do you think these can ever revive? And he says, of course not. God says, yes, they will. And that's, that's a vision that Ezekiel has for the Jewish people that today appears to be totally defeated, totally vanquished, with oh, no hope at all, eventually will be rebuilt, will be rebuilt again. In fact, the, the, um, the uh, Atikva is uh, it taken on that, on one of the lines of, the, of Ezekiel, when the people say, our hope has been lost. And in the Atikva, the anthem of Israel, we say, our hope is not lost. And that is the story of the story of the second temple. Oh, I'm sorry, of the first temple destruction the time of the prophets. We will be discussing in the next lecture how what happens in exile and how eventually they return to the Israel to rebuild the second temple.